Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm Kate Seeley, Vice President of the Middle East Institute. And I'm delighted to welcome you to today's panel marking the public release of Zogby Research Service's most recent poll on Middle East public opinion prepared for the Surbaniyas Forum, a policy uh, forum organized by the UAE Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the poll surveyed over 8,000 adults from across the Arab world, Turkey and Iran, on attitudes uh, on everything from domestic priorities to regional concerns uh, to concerns about extremism. And at a time of uh, regional tensions, uh, economic hardships, and a waning uh, sort of US influence in the region, this poll gives us a very interesting snapshot of how individuals in the Middle East view uh, key issues defining their lives. Uh, we're honored to have with us today Jim Zogby here to present the key findings, as well as a panel of experts to drill, drill deeper into the implications of the poll. Jim is president of the Arab American Institute and director of Zogby Research Services, a firm that has conducted surveys all across the Middle East for many years now. Uh, for the past three decades, he served in leadership roles in the Democratic National Committee and uh, with the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, and if I didn't mention it, he's also president of the Arab American Institute. Jim is going to present on the poll, and that will be followed by a discussion with our panelists who will uh, come up on stage afterwards. So thank you, Jim, and please take the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, and thanks, um, uh, and thanks to Paul Salem and the Middle East Institute for, for co-hosting this. This is um, uh, maybe the sixth, for, I don't know, we've been, I've been polling for the Cervantes Forum now since 2011. Um, and what's interesting are not only the results, but sometimes seeing them in the historical context of where the numbers were and what has happened um, in terms of broader attitudes as we, as we move forward. Um, let me begin. Uh, I'm not going to start with that one. I want to start with some that I don't have charts for, but you have them in the book um, on the, the very first page uh, of numbers, which would be the black and white chart on page five. It identifies the, the number one political priorities. We asked people to rank political priorities in their countries. And what was, uh, 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 we've been doing this question now going back to um, mass movement, people getting the numbers, okay. We've been asking people to identify political priorities now for um, uh, for almost, well, about 15 years. Uh, since 2002 was, I think, the first time we did it. And historically, what we would always get in one order or another would be uh, employment, in increasing employment, improving health care, uh, improving educational opportunities, um, they would always be in one order or another, and then there'd be a fourth in the mix somewhere. Um, as you can see from this one, uh, employment is number one in eight of the ten countries, but the rest has changed, and it's almost a post-Arab spring phenomena that we've seen. Uh, the first time we noticed it was in the 2012 poll that we did, where we actually saw issues of political reform or issues of dealing with corruption or issues dealing with one or another problems of governance, protecting political rights and civil liberties, et cetera, being um, in the top tier items. In this one, employment is number one, uh, but if you notice, uh, political reform uh, and reforming government is in seven of the countries, it's a top tier item. Um, and in Egypt, the number one issue is ending corruption, which was in 2000, in the early in the early time, and then up to 2012 was ranked, you know, in the the top tier. But it's number one at at this point, and so I thought that was kind of significant. The other is um, the next chart you'll see is to do with foreign policy issues, which we simply took three, which are the most topical in the region: uh, concern about Iran, uh, the war in Syria and Israel-Palestinian rights. You hear from a lot of people that Palestinian rights is no longer a top tier item. When you ask people on the street whether it's top tier or not, it's top tier. In six of the 10 countries, it's the number one issue. Um, and across the board, 
ranks higher than most of the other issues in the aggregate. And finally, well, let's get to the right track, wrong track numbers, which are the ones that, uh, that's up here. And here, I, I think, is an interesting um, issue that we will look at now, but then we'll see it play out again in the next one, and that is that Tunisia and Egypt, the two countries that were the Arab Spring countries, are clearly being perceived as being on the, 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 the wrong track. 20% uh, in Tunisia, right track, 67% wrong track. In Egypt, it's uh, 19 right track and 55% wrong track. Um, when Arab Spring first occurred in Egypt, the numbers were 80 plus percent right track and the same in Tunisia. Um, you got another bounce in Egypt at the time of uh, Tumarud when public mood was high, but, uh, but those numbers have again dropped to I think a, a extremely low level. Um, in Saudi Arabia and Iran, interestingly enough, um, the, the, the split's about the same in terms of right track, wrong track. And the UAE historically has the highest uh, right track numbers uh, in the region. We only polled citizens in, in UAE. Now, on the next slide, we sort of spread it out and ask questions of confidence in institutions. We asked about the military, the police, judiciary, religious establishment, media, and parliament. The Egypt and Tunisia numbers, again, that's the blue and purple, if you notice, um, are decidedly negative, clear across the board. Um, and I would think that that should be worrisome in both countries. Um, <coughs> the Saudi Arabia and UAE numbers are fairly high, um, very high actually, and the Iran numbers are again high and in the positive in every single one of the institutions <coughs> mentioned. The next slide is going to deal with the next couple of slides are going to deal with the Israel-Palestine question and how people in the region view it. There's a lot of talk in the ultimate deal of having the the Arab states unite with Israel as part of a coalition against uh, Iran and against extremism. We asked this question last year. We ask it again this year. The numbers haven't changed significantly, but you will notice that on the question of forming a partnership um, whether or not Israel ends the Palestinian occupation, um, there's no support for it at all. Uh, in blue, uh, partnership shouldn't be pursued even if Israel ends the occupation and makes peace with the Palestinians. 60% um, in Saudi Arabia and UAE, which would be the two key partners in, in this, because Egypt and Jordan already have a peace treaty, and yet majorities in both countries are still opposed to it. Um, and a partnership desirable only if Israel ends the occupation. Again, um, you have a, a, a significant number, but overall, decidedly, public opinion is against a partnership um, under any condition. On the question of Palestinians and their view of the peace, of the peace in initiative, the Arab peace initiative, <coughs> We've gotten these numbers almost since the beginning, between two-thirds and 70 percent uh, and, and three-quarters, rather, of Arab public opinion generally would support the Arab Peace Initiative. Uh, if Israel took the steps required, they would be willing to make peace. Um, the Palestinians are still there, but uh, as you can see from the yellow, they are ready for peace, but they don't think Israel is ready for peace. And that's where a plurality of the opinion is. Um, and there still is about 30% uh, of Palestinians who wouldn't want to make peace even if Israel did honor the terms. And you see that play out in the next graph, which when we ask them which option would they be inclined to support, a one state, a two state, or they don't believe a settlement between Israelis and Palestinians is possible, and you find that among Palestinians, the number has now climbed to one half of Palestinian public feels that no peace is even possible. They've given up real hope that a peace could be achieved. And the split is 25-25 between whether wanting a one state and a two state. In another survey, we just completed a rather exhaustive one in the West Bank, Gaza, Jerusalem, and among Israelis and Israeli settlers. We found that actually the numbers were a little higher for one state 
um, than the 25%. It was, it was almost 30% among Palestinians and among Israelis favored the one state solution, but when you then drill deeper and ask what they mean by one state, Palestinians say one state means equal rights for everybody, and Israelis mean Palestinians get booted out. They wanted Palestinians transferred to Jordan as the best option to make one state. Um, now let's go to Yemen. And here I think is one of the more interesting findings in the poll. If you notice the, the light blue, green, the blue, green, whatever, uh, on top, that is whether or not they view as their most important concern the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. When we polled last year, the number <coughs> in Egypt was 29%. It's now 44%. It was 21% in Lebanon. It's now 32. It was 15 in Jordan. Is now 36. It was 10% in Saudi Arabia and is now 39. And was 9% in UAE and it's now 43. So in the two countries most directly engaged in Yemen, um, you have 40% and in UAE plus uh, 40% believing that the most important issue is the humanitarian crisis, a growing awareness of that issue that didn't exist uh, up until this year. Uh, the best solution for Yemen um, is split between whether or not restoration of the legitimate government, <coughs> which is favored in the UAE and favored in Jordan and Lebanon, or negotiations leading to a compromise among the warring parties <coughs> and establishment of government representing all the parties, which is interestingly enough supported by almost two-thirds of Saudis and again two-thirds of, of Egyptians. Now let's look at Syria. We wanted to know how people in the region view the role of different countries in Syria. We actually went through all of the countries. You'll see the charts there, the, the tables there in the book. But I just pulled out for this PowerPoint a couple that I thought were, were interesting to note. In the first set, we match up the US and Russia. Um, we didn't match them up in the poll. We didn't say which one is better. We asked each one separately. But you notice that the US and, and Russia numbers um, pretty much track, um, the U.S. being somewhat less favorable in, in, um, in, in, in I'm sorry, in, uh, in Egypt and Iraq, but more favorable in the rest of the countries. And in the UAE <coughs> and Saudi Arabia, uh, the U.S. has a decided edge over the role of Russia in Syria. Um, but look at the positives of the U.S. role in in Egypt. Look at the positive of the U.S. role in Iraq. That will play out later in terms of when we see the U.S. and favorable ratings in both countries, which is decidedly low. Two countries where we conceivably have the most at stake and we have the most presence in terms of military shipments and, and, uh, and military relationship. Um, those two countries have the worst attitude toward the United States and the involvement, its involvement in the region. Um, now to the next slide, we paired up, in this instance, we did more than pair, we did Iran, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia, who are the regional competitors, um, and <coughs> you can see that the, the, I mean, what's playing out is the, the, US, the, the Saudi Arabia and uh, Turkey uh, competition is, is quite real. Um, Iran is off the charts negative in most countries except uh, in Iraq. Uh, but even, and even in Lebanon, it has a decidedly negative uh, view of its role in, um, um, in, in Syria. But look at, and this is something that we first began noticing in 2011, look at the sectarian split, which I think is quite interesting. Sunni in Iraq have a 57% favorable view of Iran, um, negative view of Iran, sorry, and a 2% favorable view, whereas Shia have a 23% negative view and a 41% positive view. That in itself is interesting in Iraq that you have about a quarter of the Shia population have a negative view of Iran across the board. But in Saudi Arabia, um, the bottom one, look at that. It's like a red state, blue state, American split. Um, and when people ask me, how do you know people are telling you the truth? 
uh, in these polls, when I get a poll that says to me that 91% of Shia in Saudi Arabia think that Iran is playing a positive role, um, uh, I think that they're telling me something that I have to pay attention to. Um, and it's the same if you look in, in, in the, the full table you have there. They also view Saudi Arabia as playing a negative role in, in, uh, uh, in Syria. So this split is something quite worrisome. It's something that has developed over the last uh, decade or so and is, is really quite pronounced in, in all of the countries uh, where there's a, uh, a Sunni Shia uh, mix in population. The next is the best future for Syria. And here I think the most interesting thing was the light blue in the middle, which is negotiations leading to a national unity government with the participation of Bashar al-Assad. In previous years, the, the, the regime of, of Bashar al-Assad was viewed as taboo in most Arab countries. Um, that is clearly no longer the case. And in, if you look at the UAE number, uh, which is 29 this year, Last year, it was zero. In Saudi Arabia, it's 24 this year, about a quarter of the population. Last year, it was 2%. Um, still is the case that in most of the countries, Egypt in particular, Saudi Arabia, and UAE, the future, the best future for Syria is still viewed as negotiations leading to government without him, but that has declined um, precipitously in some of the countries. And, in UAE, 97% were in that camp last year. This year, it's down to 54%. So I think that that's something, actually, that there's a dawning recognition that he's not going away, and we have to figure out a way to make it, make it, make it happen. <clears throat> now let's switch to Iran. First was, we asked people a historic question. We said, how did you feel about the P5 plus 1 when it occurred? Did you support it or oppose it? Over 50% in every country said they supported it. That pretty much was what we found when we polled on Iran back in, in two years ago when this was first news. Uh, a, a, a slight majority everywhere supported it. Opinion was somewhat split. We then asked a question uh, about whether or not they felt that it was successful. And in J Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey, they said it was successful, and in Egypt, Iraq and UAE opinion was split, but opinion was somewhat divided as to whether it was successful or not. Nevertheless, when we asked the next question, whether or not they supported the Trump, the Trump administration's decision to pull out of the P5 plus one, um, support was extremely high in the UAE and Saudi Arabia, but it was also high in Iraq, Jordan. Egypt was the only country that opposed the decision to pull out of the P5 plus one. We then asked a series of questions about if a new agreement were to be negotiated, what would you want in it? And here's what we found. We found if you look at the second on the top line, the number one thing that they seemed to want most in almost every instance was an end of Iranian involvement in Arab conflicts. So it, it very well may be that what is the Trump administration is trying to do um, is on the right track in terms of where Arab public opinion is. Um, uh, th there is only in Egypt is there support for um, Iran participating in a regional security framework, somewhat also positive in Iraq. Um, and another issue of concern uh, in Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE is an end to Iran's Nuke, uh, ballistic, mi ballistic missile program. But the number one issue that gets over the 50% line in every country is ending Iran's involvement in, uh, in regional conflicts. Possibility for Iran and the Arab world to live in peace. The dark green is very possible. The light green is somewhat possible. Um, with the exception of Egypt, um, a majority in every country thinks it's somewhat possible, at least, that there be peace. Iran, Iranians themselves are the most positive about this, um, but there's not a great deal of enthusiasm um, because the very possible is, is, uh, um, is, is quite low in most countries. Now we go to polling in Iran itself. We ask Iranians about their satisfaction with the government's performance in several areas, and you can see that it's down. 
down from where it was last year um, in areas of economy, democracy, civil rights, and then support to their allies in the region. Uh, the other two relations with Arab governments and relations with the West are new. We, we asked them this year, we'd asked them in earlier years, but we didn't ask them last year. Uh, we asked Iranians then um, whether or not it was a good thing uh, that they have a nuclear weapon or whether or not the, the P5 plus one was a good thing. And what we found was um, in 2015, 32% of Iranians thought it was a good thing that they gave up their weapons program. 68% said it was a bad thing. In 2018, that number is now 45 think it was a good thing that they gave up their weapons program. 55% said it's negative. But when we ask the question, should Iran have a nuclear weapon, 41% um, in blue said that yes, they should because their country is a major nation and should have it. The next one, 43% in yellow, said as long as other countries have weapons, we need them also. Only 16% said it was always wrong, so no country, including my own, should have them. The Ayatollah, who has pretty much said that having a nuclear weapon is a wrong thing, morally wrong, and should, is clearly not reaching m most of his people. Um, about 80% of Iranians think that they should have a nuclear weapon. We asked this question every year about involvement in various regional conflicts. It was the highest in 2014. By 2016, when the, the P5 plus one was in full swing, uh, the numbers had dropped rather precipitously. But as Iranian disenchantment with how P5 plus one was being implemented, the numbers went back up. Um, and now we can see that they're somewhat down but still, a majority in every instance felt that the involvements in Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Yemen were worth it, um, and that the government should continue to be involved. Now, there is a very large table where we rank all the countries in terms of favorable rating and unfavorable rating across the board, but I pulled out just a few um, for, to make some charts, and I'll show them to you next. Overall, EU and China come out best. EU comes out the, the, the very best. Um, Turkey and Saudi Arabia do quite well and are actually quite paired up against each other as, as regional rivals. Um, the US and Iran come out poorest um, in almost every country, um, except uh, Iran does okay, just okay. There's a split in Lebanon and in um, uh, Iraq. And the US does very well in UAE and Saudi Arabia, but otherwise numbers were quite low. Let's look at a few. Here's Egypt. And you can see in Egypt where the US numbers are. Um, the next one is Iraq. And again, the US numbers in Iraq are quite low. Um, with almost everybody else other than the EU uh, coming in at around 50%. The next is how Saudi Arabia ranks in these various countries, and Saudi Arabia does very well everywhere but in Turkey and in Iran. Over 50% in all of them, ranking very high. Uh, its attitude, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is not attitudes towards Saudi Arabia, it's Saudi Arabia's attitude towards other countries uh, doing very well, in, in uh, the U.S. does very well there, as does China and the, U and the EU, but Turkey and Iran do quite poorly. And finally is uh, UAE's attitudes, and UAE attitude toward the U.S. is very high, toward Saudi Arabia is extremely high. Um, it was like 96%, and I think 4% had no view at all or something like that. China and EU, again, high, but Iran, quite low. Um, that's pretty much where we are. That's the end of, uh, of, the, of the report uh, as I have it now. Um, and I'd be happy to have the panel come and talk and take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Jim. Uh, maybe, uh, let's see, everybody's got to squeeze in from here. Let me uh, please come on through. Really smart. Can you get a sign in?
Thank you so much, Jim, for that uh, fascinating overview of the poll, which we'll be getting into shortly. Uh, let me just introduce uh, all the panelists first, uh, then we'll uh, talk to Jim a bit and move on. Um, Nadia Bilbasi uh, was unfortunately unable to join us today. She was going to be talking about Arab reactions to the poll. Uh, here to fill in for her is Paul Salem, president of the Middle East Institute. Uh, Paul's work focuses on issues of political change, transition, and conflict, as well as the regional and international relations of the Middle East. He's the author and editor of numerous books, including From Chaos to Cooperation, Toward Regional Order in the Middle East, and Broken Orders, The Causes and Consequences of the Arab Uprisings, among other publications. Also joining us today is Steve Cook. Thank you so much, Steve, who will discuss the results of the poll relating to Turkey and probably also Egypt, another specialization of his. Uh, Stephen is the Eni Enrico Mate Senior Fellow for Middle East and Africa Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's an expert on uh, Turkish and Arab politics, as well as a US Middle East uh, policy expert. He's the author of False Dawn, uh, Protest, Democracy, and Violence in the New uh, Middle East, as well as The Struggle for Egypt from Nasser to Tahrir Square, among other publications. And finally, last but not least, we'll be joined by, we are joined by MEI Senior Fellow Alex Vatanka, who will be discussing the views from Iran and the region's reaction to the nuclear deal uh, and the possibility for Iranians and Arabs to uh, ever live happily together in peace. Uh, Alex specializes in uh, Middle Eastern regional security affairs with a focus on Iran. He's the author of Iran and Pakistan, Security, Diplomacy, and American Influence, and a forthcoming book on Iranian regional security. Jim, let me just start with you, since you have been doing these polls for so many years. I'm just curious, what really stood out for you, um, either uh, as an indicator of a changing regional dynamic or as a testament to an enduring view, regardless of changing regional dynamics, that you found extremely noteworthy? I, I think that the two issues that I found noteworthy and worrisome were, um, well, the one was noteworthy and worrisome. The other one is just noteworthy. The first was the... Um, the uh, U.S. numbers, the favorable rating and, and performance in Syria and performance in Iraq uh, across the board in Egypt um, and in Iraq itself. Uh, the U.S. has troops in Iraq. Uh, we feel strongly uh, as Americans that we played a significant role in freeing uh, Iraq of, of, of ISIS, and yet Iraqis are, are decidedly against and have always been Actually, since the very beginning of our polling, we found that uh, Iraqis are, are not favorably inclined toward the United States. We are not a welcome presence in the country. The other was the, the, uh, the humanitarian crisis issue in, in opinion across the region. That was something that uh, last year was not on the charts, and this year has grown rather significantly uh, in the Arab world. It clearly is something that is felt here in the West, but it's also viewed in the Arab world rather rather decidedly. And the, the other, and the last one, I think, is something that I know Steve and I are going to talk about, and that's Egypt. Um, the numbers in Egypt are um, have gone south, and they've, gone, they've moved decidedly lower um, in every year since 2013, and, and yet people, I think, are in denial about it. Um, Which numbers in particular? The, well, when 41% when of Egypt, Egyptians think um, that uh, have no confidence in the military, um, whereas in 2013 it was 94% had confidence in the military, and then it went down a year later to 70%, and now we're in the 41% range. That's a number I'd be concerned about. That was the one institution that Egyptians had significant positive feelings towards. And their attitude toward other institutions in the country and the right track, wrong track numbers, those aren't good numbers. Um, and so I don't know what it means in terms of, does it mean we're in a, a sort of a, a pre-revolutionary phase? Or I, I can't say that. Uh, I'm not sure that each, that's a, an issue beyond what the numbers tell you. But it does tell you that Egyptians aren't happy with their circumstance. And I think that's something to pay attention to. Yeah, definitely. Ending corruption is one of the number one priorities uh, yeah. today, um, many years after the Arab Spring. That, that says a lot. All right, I'm going to try to be very systematic uh, with this panel. I want to first talk about uh, domestic uh, policy uh, attitudes, and I want to get into regional 
concerns and then end on this issue of uh, why the U.S. is so unpopular these days and why the EU and China are so loved. And I'm going to start with you, Paul, and talk a little bit about the Arab world. I mean, consistently, the issue of employment, or as we should say, unemployment, uh, has been a number one issue. It was there this year and last year. But we saw some other new concerns pop up that are new. Uh, Jim referenced them. Women's rights showed up as number two and number three in many countries, personal rights. Uh, can you weigh in on what uh, you found significant in the, in, the, in, in the domestic area? Yeah, I found it. Uh, a lot of things are, are, were very sort of interesting and fascinating to me. One was, and, and some of them were already highlighted by Jim, but maybe I'll comment them on them a bit more, that the prominence of political reform still uh, in almost all the countries um, to me is very, very significant. Obviously, people need employment and health care and so on, but that the fact that they would continue to come back to political change, political reform is a, very key, is a very key issue, indicates to me that the engines, the things we saw in 2011 and so on, are not only not going away and that people are unhappy, but that people are still identifying a change in political systems or some kind of political reform as a very important thing for themselves and their countries. And this runs uh, importantly counter to the narrative that is being put out there by governments in the region that look this whole Arab Spring, you know, political change thing was a disaster, and trying to convince themselves and maybe outsiders and maybe their own people that look, as long as we get it that you need jobs and so on, but you really don't care about the other stuff. And it's important to me that people are still identifying that political change is extremely important, that that issue is not at all dying. Uh, on some other uh, uh, interesting results on, again, touched on before, on right track, wrong track, that both Egypt and Tunisia feel that they're on the wrong track. Interestingly, those are the two tracks in a way. You can either go towards democratization in a sense, uh, or you can go towards strong state and kind of crack down. Obviously, there are other tracks, but it is interesting that, Tuni that both of them feel they're on the wrong track. Uh, and that raises questions among you know, people looking at political reform and so on, that uh, what does that mean? Either it could, it could mean that, that these were the countries where people were the most upset anyway in 2011 because they're the ones that came out uh, quickest and revolted and that they're still upset and still unhappy. Two, it could be a direct indication of economics. Obviously, the Tunisian economy is in shambles, as is the Egyptian economy. So it could be that. Um, but it's something that's very significant, that the two main tracks were kind of uh, rejected. Um, but the yeah. transition companies definitely, transition countries definitely seem to be most in crisis, Egypt, Tunisia, and Iraq. Well, that's what, yeah, what I wanted to comment on, is it that they're the ones who were most upset. They revolted, you have to keep that in mind. And obviously all their problems are not, are not resolved. So is it simply a continuation of that high uh, dissatisfaction that they expressed just seven, you know, seven years ago that's still there? Or does it mean that the transition is rejected and you know, they want to turn somewhere else? That, maybe from the numbers, obviously is not altogether uh, clear. On confidence in institutions, I mean, obviously <laughs> Egypt is, is, is a clear case. What kind of struck me was uh, the Iraqi numbers and alarmed me. I mean, obviously Iraqis, they're unhappy, the situation is terrible, economic security, corruption, you can't blame them. But to see uh, the very low number in Iraq of confidence in the military, 80%, after the military and others defeated ISIS was kind of took me aback a little bit to see that number that high. And uh, just after parliamentary elections, to have 94% uh, not have confidence in the parliament they just <laughs> elected a few weeks ago. Uh, and in a humorous, maybe, uh, uh, comment on parliaments and confidence, the two countries where there's the most confidence in parliament are countries Interestingly, they don't have parliaments. <laughs> some, some of the contradictions of Saudi Arabia, yes. UAE. But, we love them. Yes. They don't exist. But there was so some good true. news out of Iraq mm -hmm. that I'd love you to comment on between 2017 and 2018. In 2017, a plurality of Iraqis uh, wanted uh, autonomous regions. And yes. in 2018, most wanted a reformed uh, 
government representing a whole Iraq, mm -hmm. a unified Iraq. That's progress that yeah, relates and to maybe, current political uh, change. Maybe that could be a question to Jim either now or later. I mean, obviously the Kurds went through a disastrous referendum for independence. I wondered, is that a swing in the in the Kurdish vote? Obviously, there was the ISIS experience in the Sunni areas as well. Maybe that's a recognition that they want to remain part of a unified state. Although in the other question later on, it's the Sunnis who still want a federal uh, uh, you know, system, whereas yeah. the Kurds and the Shia, according to the poll results, are more reconciled to to more unified. So they're interesting results, no doubt, and I wonder if the Kurds swung it one yeah, way or the other. Very possibly. Let me bring um, Steve into the uh, debate on Egypt. Um, should we be worried about Egypt right now, based on what we're reading from this poll? Well, we should always be worried about Egypt, but certainly on this poll, if you just look at the, the confidence in the institutions right around track numbers, uh, this is an extraordinary rebuke of the CC era. Uh, the, especially what struck me is, you know, are you better or worse off than five years ago? Well, what happened five years ago? It's when CC came to power promising uh, that there was going to be positive change, prosperity, uh, security. Uh, clearly, uh, that has not happened. Uh, it's stunning to me in the, in the confidence uh, in institutions that 59% of respondents in Egypt said they were not confident in the military. Um, Previously, Egyptians have compartmentalized <coughs> the armed forces, uh, the armed forces that accomplished the, uh, the crossing of the Suez Canal in October 1973, and then there was the SCAF. Um, clearly, that is no longer a distinction that is being made um, among Egyptians. And I think it's a function of the fact that the, Egyptians, uh, the Egyptian military has not learned from its own history. Uh, that it has become uh, much more autonomous, much more involved in the economy, obviously much more involved in the political system. And that has consequences for them and for the country and the political standing of their delegate uh, at the presidency. Um, it, the other thing that I think was very important was this question of right track, wrong track. 64% um, believe that they're worse off, as I said, President Sisi had promised a certain number of things. Certainly, this has to do with wrenching economic reforms. And I suspect that if you had an official of the Egyptian government, you'd say, well, of course, you know, uh, Egyptians are suffering right now, but this is all for the greater good. But if you pair that number up with the number of people who believe the country is on the wrong track, you have to wonder about the support for the range of economic reforms that, uh, that, the, uh, that the government has undertaken. Uh, it's likely only to get worse as uh, the uh, Egyptian parliament, um, which by the way had a 27% approval rating. I have confidence. Uh, I would like to meet those 27 people. Uh, <laughs> rather extraordinary. That was, that was a number that jumped out to me as being actually rather high. But the Egyptian parliament is now going to make it so that uh, President Sisi can be the president for life. Uh, and the argument being that you need a steady hand to bring Egypt through this very difficult period, but uh, anybody reading this poll numbers would suggest that the Egyptians would like another hand to bring them uh, through. They I, clearly I, want political reform. We clearly want political reform, which is uh, among their top uh, top categories. Uh, it, it is, um, as I started, it is a rebuke of the last five years and everything that Egyptian officialdom wants people to believe about Egypt. Well, let's uh, also get to Turkey, uh, Steve, very quickly. Um, I found it interesting that in the Turkish polls, uh, democracy and women's rights were number three and number four, respectively, showing, perhaps suggesting growing alarm with Erdogan's, uh, you know, the, the <laughs> direction he's taking the country. And how, how did you read the, the Turkey poll results? Yeah, that was, that was interesting. I, and one and two, <coughs> employment and education were things that didn't, did not surprise me at all. But democracy was very interesting. It really jumped out at me. And because Turkey is such a polarized society, it's hard to know whether people are saying that uh, they're so concerned about the authoritarian turn in Turkey that Turkey's become an elected autocracy, or they're saying they're so happy because democracy under the AKP and President Erdogan has flourished. And that, that is, you can put two Turks together and they will have uh, compelling narratives about each. But uh, clearly, um, there are lots of people in, in Turkey who are, who are concerned about the quality of politics, as well as there are clearly a lot of people who think that Turkey has progressed uh, over the course of the last 15 years during the, the Justice and Development Party's uh, uh, tenure. And there, there is reason for them to believe that. Um, it is, I think, a different conception of democracy than 
those who would say that they're quite worried about it. But I'd imagine that there is some declining in, uh, confidence in some of the institutions in Turkey, uh, courts and the military. Your poll, Jim, did not look at that question in Turkey. We, d we did, but the results were, um, were, we called them into question because of the way that the data came through to us. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, um, we're still, wor we're actually re-polling um, across the board on the first set of, I guess, four or five questions. Okay, but I would imagine also very uh, split views on public well, institutions. I, I would think that one of the problems with the, with the polls on those questions in particular <coughs> has to do with the uh, compulsion upon, under which Turks will now live. Uh, and perhaps the fear of saying, I'm not confident in the presidency, I'm not confident in the parliament. Um, but again, we'll, we'll just have to see how it comes out after Jim, uh, Jim repolls. But um, certainly, uh, I expect that um, when it's redone, there'll, there'll be uh, significant concern about track and uh, confidence in certain institutions, absolutely. Thank you, Alex. It looks like there's a growing lack of confidence in uh, the Iranian leadership uh, in the wake of uh, the uh, U.S. pullout from the P5 plus one. Your thoughts on some of these polling figures relating to Iran, democracy, rights, the, the economy? Right. Thank you, Kate. Um, you know, my first, to, to your point about what does it take for the Iranians and the Arabs to coexist, Looking at these numbers, clearly the first thing that needs to happen is for Iran to get out of the Arab world and then start the process of dialogue. Uh, that certainly seems to me to be the loud message coming from, from the um, data here. But look at page five that Jim, uh, James and his team have put together. Look where Iran or Iranians put the issue of foreign enemies on their list of priorities. They're not worried about them. The last one on the item comes after employment, women's rights, political reform, health care, you, you name it, which those of us who are Iran watchers are not surprised by. Average Iranians don't really care about or care for Iran's foreign policy, what they call adventurism in the region. What you also have is those recipients in the Arab world equally would want to see Iran end its meddling interventions that are oft oftentimes costly and come at the expense of the needs of ordinary Iranians. Uh, let me tell you, uh, Kate, very quickly what surprised me uh, in many ways was how only a small majority in Lebanon and Iraq had a favorable view of Iran. That did surprise me. But if you look at the list of eight Arab countries, Qatar is not there, Oman is not there, Algeria is not there. These are the cases where you would expect Iran to pull better. What, as I said, is not surprising to me is that the vast majority of Iranians are far less interested in the Arab world or what the Iranian regime is doing in their name in the Arab world. And I would put it to you this way. You can, you can uh, measure this in terms of costs for the nation. Direct cost in terms of what Iran is spending in places like Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere. And the indirect costs that come with being involved in the Arab world, which I would put uh, US sanctions under. The, you know, Donald Trump pulling out of the nuclear agreement is an indirect cost that the Iranian nation are paying, or you, you could even argue direct cost for their interventions in, in the region. And one of the, um, one of the realities of what's happening in terms of Iranian foreign, 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 Iranian foreign policy that so many Arabs are upset about is this is a relatively new phenomenon. This is a post-79 <coughs> phenomenon. Iran was involved in the Arab world, was involved in Lebanon and elsewhere to some extent, was even involved in the Yemeni civil war back in the 60s and so on, but not to the scale we see it today. So what you have in Iranian foreign policy behavior is a, new, is a whole new chapter, if you will, uh, where they are um, so hands-on involved. Uh, and as I just said, I don't think they have the Iranian people behind them. Before I stop, Kate, let me, I don't have the exact numbers. Um, I, I wanted to see what the population of the MENA region is, Middle East, North Africa. And it's somewhere between the 336 million, <coughs> 400 million, right? 4.7%, based on what I could find, are 65 years and older. It's tiny. Put to you differently, it's a young demographic you're looking at. This is a young demographic that does not remember Iran of before 1979. All they know is the Iran of Ayatollah Khomeini and Ayatollah Khamenei. And that's a structural problem for the, <coughs> for the Iranians. And, and I think if 
if you are sitting in Tehran, what lesson would you take away from this? Would you think of, of this as sort of uh, data that would push you in the direction of staying the course? And I would arguably, sadly say, maybe. Because one of the things that comes out of this report is how important the Palestinian issue is. And that's one that the Iranians feel is their ace card to play against the regional rivals like Saudi Arabia and UAE. This is why in the last couple of weeks we heard from senior Iranian leadership during the so-called Islamic Unity Week in Tehran that they are going to double down supporting for Palestinian groups, including paying uh, financial aid to the so-called martyrs of Hamas, Hamas operatives and so forth. So the Iranians, instead of looking at this data and saying, OK, we've been doing it wrong. We don't have our people behind us. Maybe let's go back and rethink, might actually just say, look, the Palestinian issue is very important to them. They still don't like Israel. That's how we're going to go after Saudi Arabia. Unfortunately, I think that's where Iran's going to go. Mm. Too bad, because 47% uh, of Iranians actually uh, do support a verifiable Iranian commitment and its support for and withdraw troops. Uh, uh, in the Arab world. That's astonishing. That's right. And I think, you know, frankly, I, I would love to talk to James more about how this poll was conducted. For Iranians to say, I want to pull out of Syria, I mean, there's cost associated with answering that, frankly, to somebody who, you know, I don't, as I said, I don't know the methodology here, but it's a very sensitive question. And I, if people were true, uh, truly free to express their views, I would think the percentage might much higher than that. Well, I want to bring uh, Paul and uh, Steve into this discussion about uh, Iran's role in the region, because really the figures um, are so interesting. So uh, Iranian participation in a regional security arrangement with <laughs> Arab countries to help bring peace to the region. That was one of the questions. Do people consider that important or not important? Uh, in uh, the Arab world, uh, the numbers were uh, quite high. Uh, in Egypt, 98% of Egyptians thought it was important that uh, we engage Iran, 81% uh, in Lebanon, 62% in Jordan, even higher in Turkey, which we'll get to. Paul, uh, talk about how Arabs are viewing the conflicts in their region and, 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 and the pathways toward solutions, which clearly in their minds seem to include Iran, although ironically, Iran remains one of their greatest fears, uh, as, as is indicated in all the polls. Yeah, I think they're very interesting and significant results. I mean, one about the attitude towards Iran it was surprising, and I couldn't quite understand it, that the most hostile to Iran were countries which are not affected by Iran, which was Tunisia and Egypt. Right. Mm -hmm. And that just was surprising to me. Equally surprising was the result from Egypt, which is 97% hostile to Iran, but 98% Iran should be part of an Arab-Iranian regional security framework. So right. it seems to be... Uh, interesting and a bit contradictory. But to me, uh, it's a very, very fundamental result that uh, the majorities, that majorities in Arab countries today dare to say and dare to think uh, that the Arab world should engage with Iran and should find a way for an inclusive regional security framework. Of course, that's something we've worked on a lot here at MEI, and, and to my mind, that is the only pathway forward, but it's something that's been fiercely resisted by not all, but many Arab governments. It also <laughs> runs counter to 70 years of Arab nationalism, the Arab identity, and the Arab order. So to see the population sort of think it through and come to this con conclusion is, is historic to right. my mind and should be emphasized. Uh, also to look at public opinion results in Saudi Arabia, that even in Saudi Arabia you get that yes. result. Uh, and even in Saudi Arabia, when asked about Yemen, they say a negotiated settlement with everybody included uh, is important. That also indicates to me that the government in Saudi Arabia is way to the right of the, of the population. Yeah. Uh, and I think those are very, very important developments. I also link it a little bit to the results on Israel. Um, maybe I have a different take than Jim's. I mean, of course, still majorities are hostile. But um, to have sizable minorities, 40% in countries in the Arab world, uh, saying, well, if there were peace, a partnership with Israel is conceivable or is their choice, to me is mind boggling. I mean, again, after 70 years of, let's you know, the conflict and brainwashing, and Israel is, you know, the, you know, it, it, the, the, you know, 
brain, you know, the, the, what has happened is tremendous. And to have people today, 30, 40% to come out when there's no peace and when Israel is still, you know, doing all these things, say, well, if they would only do that, we would partner with them. Mm. To me, that's astonishing, and that's, I think, a sea change towards maybe pragmatism in the, in the Middle East. And maybe in that, they are not so out of touch with some of their leaders who are partnering, okay, without peace and so on. But these are pretty significant to my mind. Steve, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Turkey-Iran <coughs> relationship, because I also think the, the numbers um, regarding, you know, Turks' views of engaging with Iran um, are very interesting, and of course that's a very significant rivalry. Uh, yes, yeah, so 72% of Iran are Turks, uh, so 78% believe in a regional security <coughs> arrangement. They also want to have Iran, you know, withdraw its troops and its, uh, its, its allies from the region. So talk a little bit about how you see that uh, rivalry and relationship uh, playing out. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the Turks are very, very good at compartmentalizing their differences with the Iranians. <coughs> so they have a mix of differences with them, obviously on Syria, obviously in Iraq. But they also look at Iran as a neighbor, uh, a country to which to, to do business. Um, and also, Turks uh, prefer a kind of non-sectarian foreign policy. Uh, and they view uh, Iran as a, a legitimate power in the region. That doesn't mean that they're not concerned about what Iran is doing around the region. But again, um, and, and because they themselves see Turkey as a natural leader of the region. And that, that's the compartmentalization part. The, uh, the Iranians mucking about in Syria, the Iranians mucking about Iraq. This is, you know, for the Turks, this is their, their backyard. But it is a, a major country for which to do business with, which uh, diplomacy is, uh, is the best way to go. And then let's, um, it, it's clear that Turks see the American confrontation with Iran, that connected American Zionist uh, confrontation that's unnecessary and will destabilize uh, that will destabilize the region and that's why I think you see the large numbers who want to see Iran play you know negotiation with the Iranians the Iranians playing a role in the region but a constructive one um, the the Turks after the bitter experience of two wars in Iraq uh, that in different ways undermine their security would not like to see the kind of confrontation that you know some might. <coughs> between the United States and Iran, especially since so many, so susceptible to the AKP worldview, um, see this as really just uh, for, uh, in, in Israel's interests. Turks also seem to be quite uh, pragmatic about uh, Syria these days. Um, so in 2015, 90% uh, supported a government without Assad. Today, 61% would support a government with Assad. Uh, explain that extreme Kurds. shift. Kurds. Uh, well, I, I think there's a certain amount of realism that mm -hmm. you know, Assad right. isn't going anywhere. Right. Uh, and that Turkey's government's priorities have shifted and the people's priorities have shifted. Uh, I don't think anybody, <laughs> I, I, I think, I, I wonder about the, the, the numbers in 2015 about uh, a government without Assad. Um, I think there's, uh, there was a large, there was a significant portion of the population that question the wisdom of the AKP's uh, foreign policy with regard to Assad. Uh, at least, you know, 25, 30 percent that voted for the opposition, uh, that voted for the opposition parties. But I, I, I clearly, uh, priorities have changed as Assad, uh, it, it seems clear Assad is going to prevail. And the priority is now snuffing out uh, Kurdish nationalism along Turkey's southern border. It seems it, for, to Turks that the, the national nightmare is coming true. Uh, that there will be a terrorist state on their border, midwifed by uh, a great power. That great power being the United States, and so that is where uh, that is where people are, are focused. And the opposition has essentially lined up with the AKP on that. So it's not uh, it's not terribly surprising to me that so many Turks uh, uh, see the possibility of an accommodation with uh, with Assad, especially if he is going to be part of uh, uh, some type of solution that suppresses uh, Kurdish nationalism. But in the Arab world as well, Paul, even though numbers are still in favor of a government without Assad, you see them softening. And Arabs clearly being willing to imagine something they couldn't have imagined just a few years ago. What does that say to you about maybe conflict fatigue and Yeah, pragmatism? I think part of it is realism, that he isn't getting, going anywhere, so let's find a solution 
with him. Uh, secondly, disillusionment with what ended up being the opposition or what was presented, extremist and radical and so on, and the tremendous cost of, <coughs> of not ending the war. So if he's not going anywhere, the priority is to end the war, then it's kind of a logical, straightforward solution. That doesn't surprise me very much. I wanted to comment a bit on what the results from Iran might look like from, from the US. I take Alex's point that you know maybe people are not able to answer you know, uh, truthfully, that's, that, that's to be taken into consideration. But uh, when I'm reading the results, you know, we often say, well, it's the regime and, you know, they're really, you know, radical and so on. But the population just wants something else. Uh, on the nuclear issue, it looks like the population is way to the right of the government if, if it, you believe the results, which I imagine would be believable. They wouldn't lie about that. 80 or 90 percent think Iran should have nuclear weapons, period. That worries me in the sense that even if there's this government or a change of government, that's part of the now the Iranian national project. And that's 80, 90 percent rooted in a population. It also worries me, but I get it, that the responses might, might be wrong, but that solid majorities in Iran, at least in the poll results, support Iran's presence, or intervention if you want to call it, in Yemen and Syria and Lebanon and Iraq. Uh, you know, looking at it from the Arab world, it, you know, it gives a sense that you're at war with, with a, you know, with the nation, not so much, oh, it's just these crazy people at the top, that there is a problem potentially there in the way Iranians view or how they've been made to view uh, the world. And, and, and maybe that brings up, I mean, the issue of polling, what are people answering, how truthful, what does it mean? I mean, I wanted to maybe say this in the beginning. Every time I look at poll results from anywhere, uh, especially after the you know recent developments, even in the U.S., that you know opinion is often so much fabricated, and you have to ask, fabricated by whom? Uh, who puts these opinions? Are they put in people's minds? You know, take the U.S. case. Depends which television network you're watching. You'll end up believing those things, uh, and that's why I think the question that you didn't talk about, Jim, is very interesting. Where do people get their news? Where do they form their opinions? And are opinions real? In other words, are they a real reflection of people's real, thoughtful interests and so on? Or are they just the, the echo chamber that they're in and you ask them this question and they respond because that's, that's the environment they're living in, and, you know, especially living in the US. <coughs> that seems to be where a lot of opinion mm -hmm. comes from. Any thoughts on that, Jim, uh, having done this for A number of years? Uh, little issues along the way that I, I'd comment on. First on this one, yes, the, um, the biggest change we saw in media consumption was um, in obviously internet um, and online, which uh, today is uh, significantly higher than it was a decade ago. Um, most trusted is still family and friends. Uh, it's conversation you have with, with people you know. Um, <clears throat> that's new. I mean, that's in the last few no, years. That, cause that always has been a, uh, family and friends have always been a factor. Um, all, it's always been something that people would say we trust that more than anything. Um, a couple of things. On the Kurdish-Iraqi uh, Iraqi mm -hmm. issue, mm -hmm. uh, yes, Kurdish attitudes change significantly. And, um, and Sunni attitudes have changed. Mm -hmm. um, they are now on the side of federalism, and the Kurds are now on the side of unity, and in part because I don't think they see a future uh, with Turkey being as hostile as it is and Iran still mm. a factor and Syria imploding. Um, they do better not being landlocked in this mess but being part of a country. Um, on the issue of uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia parliament, you know, we first time we actually asked this question was a decade ago, and um, um, the Majlis Ashur in Saudi Arabia is a group of very distinguished appointed mm -hmm. people. So you're asking it about the Shura councils yeah, well, in those right. cases, yeah. They are highly respected right. in the country. So if you ask the question, you're going to get, oh, these, mm -hmm. are the, these are the pillars. I mean, they're like the appointed uh, uh, opinion leaders in the country. And uh, in the UAE, we got low numbers at one point, but the UAE has been promoting the Federal National Council mm -hmm. very significantly. And sort of whether it's real or not, um, in terms of they make the decision, uh, you will get the government saying, we're consulting with the Federal National Council on should we do this or should we do that? We're turning this over to them. And so they've come to play in terms of 
public perception a much greater role um, in, 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 in formulating policy, or at least the perception of that is there. On Iran and Lebanon and Iraq, um, Syria was the nail in the coffin. Um, Lebanon numbers on Iran were through the roof, and it was non-sectarian. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sunni always had a somewhat negative view, but Christians and Shia, really high. That's changed. It's changed since Syria. Um, on Iran and Palestine, I think, you know, sometimes I think that the biggest issue that concerns, that should concern people in the region is that what you said about Iran and Palestine being the, the weapon, um, the ultimate deal, instead of making Arab states more secure from Iran and extremism, literally hands Iran and extremist countries a weapon, two weapons to use against them. Um, and so, yes, it's interesting that half of the public, about 40% rather, would support partnering with is with uh, with Israel against, but that is what you said was pragmatism is exactly what it mm -hmm. is. Since the Arab Peace Initiative, um, uh, the same number across the Arab world um, has said we're willing to make peace with Israel and normalize if they withdraw and fulfill the terms of the agreement. But just like the Palestinians, when we ask that question in Arab countries, a significant body of Arab opinion doesn't believe Israel ever will. And so it's, it's, they feel that way. They're willing to make a pragmatic decision. They just don't think it'll ever happen. On um, the Iran and regional security, that's, look, we had OSCE and we didn't love each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so when it's presented to people as a regional security compact, it doesn't mean we're gonna like Iran. It just means we know that if we're fighting them in every country, <coughs> maybe we need a framework mm -hmm. so that we're not fighting them and can work it out. Um, so those numbers didn't surprise me. And the, the, the um, that's it. Cool. Well, clearly, uh, Arab anger toward Iran and its role in the region is a big factor in this. And I, and I thought it was um, you know, interesting that you did ask, is it possible for Iran and the Arab world to, to live together? And it was the Iranians who polled the highest. 49% say yes. Only 2% of Egyptians, uh, sorry, of Tunisians, mm -hmm. Uh, believe it's possible. It's weird. Uh, very weird. Um, <laughs> there, there's sort of a disconnect between you know what Iran thinks uh, can happen and the reality. I mean, Iranians kind of want to be loved. Uh, are they not aware of what they're doing in the region? Um, let me answer that by Kate, if I may, by kind of going back to something that Paul said because I think Paul raises a very fundamental question. He kind of left it um, open ended. So let me come in and and. and you know, throw my comments around it. He said, are we potentially not fighting the Islamic Republic, but the nation of Iran? Mm. And I just don't see evidence to say we're fighting the nation of Iran. It's the ideology of the Islamic Republic that is less than 40 years old, that is in many ways bankrupt at home. <clears throat> it's a model, it's not just a model, it's a way of life. And it's that way of life that's being thrown out, or not thrown out, people in Iran are opposing this way of life, the idea of the Vilayat and the supreme leadership. So I think that to me uh, is important to bear in mind. When I see Iranian protesters as we do, one of the, one of the key foreign, uh, foreign policy related slogans is, my life for Iran, not Syria, not Lebanon, get out of those places, think about us. They tell us it's all America's fault, they're lying, they meaning the ruling elite in Tehran. So I don't actually think the average Iranian has any interest in Yemen, and I don't think your average Iranian, frankly, despite 40 years of, of push by the regime, cares that much about what happens between Israel and Palestine. You know, you could even make that argument about Hezbollah in Lebanon. Um, I think, you know, it's an ideological project waged by a regime that has failed at home. It might have been a very different story had the Islamic Republic done wonderfully well domestically while they were doing this in the region. But the fact is they are failing at home and that by extension their foreign policies also seem to be just a costly mistake on their part. Uh, two other comments, uh, Kate, if I may. Um, you know, what does Iran have to show for it, for its interventions in the Arab world? And I'll throw the Iran-Iraq war in there. That was the big, first biggest intervention, if you will. Now, I know 
Iranian compatriots will get upset and say that was defending Iran against an Arab invasion. But the fact is Saddam Hussein wanted to cease fire from, from 1982, right? So why did the Iranian regime decide to fight for another six years? For ideological reasons, at the expense of the Iranian people. And you can continue because the list is long, excuse me, list is long in terms of what else they've done since. To, today we have Iraq being Iran's biggest trading partner. So you could make an argue, argument, well, economically it makes sense. But I'm not sure you need to have the Shia militias running around Iraq for two neighboring countries to have good economic ties. Iran's other major Arab trading partner is UAE, not a country that has great relations with Iran, certainly not the Abu Dhabi part of UAE. So I think there are ways where you can have economic, mm -hmm. to your point about what can you have in terms of that you know, paradise to come among Iranians and Arabs, you could find formulas where you can coexist, but the emphasis has to be on either other issues than the ideological issues, the proxies that the Arab Gulf states fear so much and so forth. And, and final point, we're talking about regional um, security um, framework where perhaps Iran could be a partner. Could anybody here really realistically think that is going to come about without Iran making adjustments to its Israel policy? and its policy towards the United States. It's not gonna happen. The Iranian position that yes, we can have a regional framework, but the United States needs to leave the Persian Gulf region first, it's a non-starter. So yes, I think Iran can be a partner, but they need to sort of go back and think and rethink what it is that they started back in 1979 and perhaps why it's a good time to turn the chapter and start something new. And for the life of me, I don't know why Tunisians and Egyptians fear Iran so much. <laughs> They've never met. Let me, just, let me just say something about two of the things uh, that were mentioned. One about uh, Iran and the Palestine question. I have long thought that Iran is not playing for a domestic audience, it's playing across the water. Um, and their threats against Israel are never focused at Israel, but it's across the water. Um, during the time of Iran's highest favorable rating in all the Arab countries was after 2006 in Lebanon. Um, and Iran's war cry then was, look at what your governments have done, nothing. We are the ones who stood by and we are the ones who supported. And after the war was over, Iran was the one that came in first with money, which is why Lebanon's numbers favorable rating toward Iran went very high for several, several years. So I've always believed that it was more, they know that across the water, Arab opinion toward Palestine, it's the wound in the heart that never healed. Mm -hmm. And they know that that's one that they can tweak every once in a while, and they do. Uh, not because their own people want it, but because they know that that's where Saudi opinion is, that's where Kuwaiti and everybody else is, and well, Kuwait, maybe it's a different story. Mm -hmm. um, but several other Arab countries feel very deeply about it, and that's why I think it's, why Egypt and uh, Tunisia have the hostile feelings that they do, I, <coughs> That's something worth probing. We've always found that to be the case. And while there's no direct involvement, their attitudes, even when we did a religion poll on Shiism, which is not a phenomenon in Tunisia. I mean, people were like beside themselves over the threat of, <laughs> of the Shia invasion in, uh, in Egypt and in, and in Tunisia. So it appears to be something that comes more from the religious establishment, uh, a hostility towards Shiism and toward Iran than toward, uh, and then any real real threat that's there. I just had a quick comment, a reflection on, uh, you know, Iran after 06 was number one popularity among the Arab world and the Muslim world in general. It's interesting that in Syria, they are willing to give up all their popularity in the Arab and Sunni world, like a billion people, as long as they preserve their core security corridors uh, uh, to Damascus and Hezbollah. Uh, and, and that, to me, indicates yeah. the hardcore security. Now, yeah. if you're popular, that's great, but the hell with popularity if, 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 our, interest, if right. our security interests are at stake. And I've always seen their presence in Hez you know, Hezbollah and all of that as defensive, as aggressive defense against Israel or the United States. Um, we, we did a poll yeah. in, for the BBC in 2006, 2008 rather, early 2008. And one of the questions was, name three leaders not from your own country 
that, that, are, that you most respect. In Saudi Arabia, the number one leader was Nasrallah. And number two yeah, was Bashar yeah, al-Assad. Yeah. And number three was uh, uh, Ahmadinejad. Yeah. This is from the heart of Wahhabism, right? From the heart of, of whatever. And what it was was it was the residual from Lebanon still playing out. They stood tall. They were proud. Now, after 2011, got blown out. The, the Syria thing actually was, like I said, the nail in the coffin of Iran's opinion, uh, favorable opinion in the Arab world. And, and I think you're right. I mean, there's, this, there's the side that, that says, we, we know this is a weapon. We can use Palestine anytime we want. But when it comes to defending our, our very practical, strategic goal of building this corridor that we want to protect, then we'll, we'll risk it. But we know we can play it if we have to at some point. So very briefly, we know Iran's favorability rating is low, and the US as well, which I'll ask Jim about in a second. But uh, EU and China, uh, incredibly popular yeah. in the region. Um, the weak EU, and well, we understand China. But maybe, Steve, you could comment a little bit about shifting kind of power dynamics and sort of you know roles of new powers in the region and what it means for them in the region. And the yeah, US. let me start out in the wheelhouse with, with Turkey for, for a moment. Because it used to be said that you know Turks hate everybody. <laughs> but uh, except for themselves, and but the polls show very clearly uh, that they like Russia, they like China, and they like the EU, uh, which is odd on a number of levels for all for all three of them. Uh, Russia for historical reasons, but obviously there's a certain pragmatism associated with uh, liking the Russians, and, uh, and, and if you want your interests served in Syria, you have to go to Moscow. And it's also a way of tweaking the United States. China, of course, is repressing a million Uyghurs. Right. And, and, and here is Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who holds himself out as a leader of the Muslim <laughs> world. But the Chinese have also identified Turkey as a special place for investment in their Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the EU which uh, has long uh, provided uh, sanctuary for PKK terrorists and have uh, been uh, very tough on Turkey in its, uh, in, in its reversal of its uh, the reforms that it undertook in 2003 and 2004, yet remains, uh, remains popular. Primarily, these three places, Russia, China, and the EU, are not the United States. Uh, that is the, the deterioration of relations between the United States and, and Turkey. Uh, have um, have made these countries alternatives uh, to the United States. I think China in the region, broadly speaking, I, and Paul may have a, a perspective on this, but look, um, if a uh, young uh, activist is beaten up in Tahrir Square, uh, a deputy assistant secretary of state picks up the phone and calls someone in Cairo, someone above the deputy assistant secretary of state level, uh, calls someone in, uh, in Cairo. Uh, no one from the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs calls anyone when someone gets beaten up. It's, these are uh, authoritarian systems. Uh, the, uh, the leaders in the Arab world have long been fascinated with the fact that the Chinese have been able to solve a problem that they've had, which is generating economic growth without loosening the grip on, uh, on power. And the idea that the United States, in particular, is a spent power, is an incompetent power, is uh, freighted with all kinds of ideological baggage, and that China is competent, the future, uh, and has money to spend around the region makes it, I think, uh, a, a, an attractive option in a variety of countries. Great answer. Well, thank you. I think uh, let's move on to questions from the audience. We have 15 minutes. Uh, I think I'll take two or three at a time and uh, just say your name and affiliation. I'll take the man in the back uh, and this man in the front, and I'll get you in a second, sir. <laughs> so we've got these two here. Uh, thank, thank you. Yeah, we yes, can hear you. We can hear. OK. Uh, I'm Namo Abdullah, a journalist with Rudao Media Network from Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, Mr. Zogbi, thank you very much for this uh, great poll. Uh, I just have one question to you. I see that you poll people on a Shia Sunni basis in Iraq and the rest of the of the Middle East, but I don't see it on a on an ethnic basis, Kurd Arab line. Uh, for example, I would be very interested to see if Iraqi Kurds remain largely pro-American even after the United States opposed their independence referendum. And one more question for the panel. Uh, wh what is the reason for 
the low favorability rating of the United States in Iraq? Is it just the Shia population, which is the majority? Will the United States remain unpopular among the Shias as long as Iran and US uh, will be in, in bad terms? Thank you. Okay, and then this question here, please, and then we'll take our answers. Yeah, thank you very much. Great discussion. Uh, I'm Dave Pollack from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And I wanted to ask about the timing of the polls and about something pretty dramatic that has happened since these polls were taken. Uh, the polls were, according to your methodology note at the back, were conducted in late August and early September. And in Saudi Arabia in particular, of course, since then we have had the Khashoggi affair. And other developments have taken place in other parts of the region. Maybe other panelists want to comment. But on the Saudi point, particularly, um, as it happens, I am publishing a poll today uh, that was taken in Saudi Arabia after the Khashoggi wow. affair. And what I find there is numbers that are really quite different on some of these uh, key issues. Um, perhaps. I think as a result of not only the Khashoggi affair itself, but of the American reaction to it. So for example, today you find, even though you show very high favorability for the United States mm -hmm. among the Saudi public, um, the poll that I just did shows that only 40% of the Saudi population thinks that it's important to have good relations with the United States. Mm -hmm. And even though back in August or September, favorability ratings among Saudis for their own government institutions were sky high. Today, I find that 63% of Saudis say that their government is not doing enough to combat corruption. And over 40% say that their government is not doing enough to protect individual privacy and personal safety and freedom of all citizens. So I think the timing of the poll is very significant, and all of these numbers uh, from every country are subject to change, is yes. what I'm trying to say. And maybe some of the other panelists want to think about what might have happened since early September that might have some effect on all of these numbers. Thank you. Thank you, David. Do you want to address the polling question on Sunni Shiite and Arab Kurd? Yeah, we do have numbers on Kurd, uh, Kurdish breakout. We have Kurdish Arab. Uh, breakouts, and actually, if you contact me after, I'd be happy to share those those numbers with you. But the Kurdish numbers on independence were um, were uh, sep different than or I, I, how was the question worded exactly? Was it about? Uh, are the Kurds usually for American after? Oh no 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 no. It, it, the the numbers toward America in Iraq were just abysmally low across the board. They were a little higher among the Kurds, but still not significant enough to warrant any, um, um, you know, any, any mention that it was significant. And yeah, um, I'm glad to see your polling, because I remember years ago you said you can't poll in the Arab world. Well, no, no, I, I never said that. You, you, you did at a congressional <laughs> hearing with me. But in any case, I'm glad you're doing it now. That's right. nice. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I think you're absolutely right that uh, events change and views are become uh, volatile. The only question, the only issue I take, Dave, with your findings are that they are, the questions are different, yes, a little right? Different. If you ask importance of relations, it's different than favorable attitude. Uh, importance of relations is a political question favorable as we have found over the years has to do with a whole range of, I like American culture, I want to go visit there, et cetera. So it's a, it's a different world than the political one. So we, we sometimes, we were limited in number of questions we can ask here. We're, we were limited in terms of questions, so we simply decided to track the favorable, unfavorable. And uh, as well as on government performing in areas of corruption, we didn't ask that. We asked about other um, um, confidence levels. But um, the, the numbers you, you have and the fact that the, 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 when Saudi Arabia is getting a black eye everywhere, I, I, I think in the West over the Khashoggi thing, that that would draw a certain change in attitude. The one thing I would think that is interesting 
is that Saudis have circled the wagon to some extent. And I'd like to poll now just to see whether or not that has played out. That would be my instinct, but I'm not sure from people I've talked to, but it's, I'm not sure whether or not the data would bear it out, but I do think that, that it would be worth exploring at this point to see to what extent Saudis have, have, you know, have actually done what sometimes Iranians do, which is mm -hmm. when their country is being attacked, they become more supportive than less supportive. Um, so, especially when the people attacking you are people you're ambivalent about anyway. Just, I, there was a, a question from the gentleman from Ruda about the low favorability of, of the United States in Iraq. I think it should be fairly obvious uh, what uh, the last 15 years have wrought in Iraq. It, it doesn't, it's not entirely surprising that we're in such bad shape in Iraq. And on this question of um, American reaction to the, the <laughs> Saudi reaction to the American reaction in, uh, to the Khashoggi affair, I, it, it's not at all surprising that the United States would take a hit. Um, given, first of all, the wave of kind of nationalism that have coincided with the rise of Mohammed bin Salman, uh, and the way in which um, the United States has responded to this, despite the fact that the Trump administration has done everything possible to shield the crown prince in Saudi Arabia from the criticism. Uh, just from my own anecdotal experience, in writing a piece, trying to explain why there was, as Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to, was why there was caterwauling over the, if that's the correct way to pronounce it, I actually had to look that up, uh, mm -hmm. uh, over, over the, the, the killing of Khashoggi, that there was rational and kind of emotional reasons for Americans to do it. I was essentially explaining this to Saudis, and they got very angry at me for explaining to them why Americans were uh, piling on, on on this. So <laughs> it, 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 it is not at all surprising this has become raw uh, 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 and both sides, and I expect the United States will take a hit over a longer period of time for this. There was already a sense that the United States uh, was not a as friendly to Saudi Arabia uh, as as we might suspect. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to comment on the Iraqi results related to the U.S. Obviously, it's not surprising that it would be an overall negative view, but I was surprised by the ex you know extremity of it, and that it would be. Uh, it seemed, according to the polling, among Kurds and all Shiites and all Sunnis, uh, either that it's as weird as the Tunisian hostility to Iran and maybe there's something we're, we're not understanding, uh, or there's also something we're not understanding about the catastrophically bad <laughs> image that the U.S. has in Iraq. Because in visits to Iraq, whether it's to Erbil or Baghdad and so on, particularly in the phase of the war against ISIS, there was in fact a lot of, you know, we talked to a lot of people, they might not love what the U.S. is doing, but appreciation that the U.S. was mm -hmm. key in, you know, in fighting ISIS, and so was Iran, but the U.S. played a very big role. And to, if these numbers are real, there's something we're missing. You know, not being very favorable to the U.S., I get it, but there's something either odd about the results or way deeper than, than uh, we're getting in I these think it's the I, I think it's the way deeper. Um, the, the impact of the last 15 years has been uh, decidedly, has, has had a real impact on Iraqi opinion. And I think, you know, that about the China, EU, and all the rest, uh, the uh, EU's rather benign player. Um, China invests and doesn't ask questions. Um, but the United States has had um, a, a, a different role in the region. And I always think that that the, the, the neocons who wanted the Iraq war and argued in that project for a new American century that a decisive show of force would project American hegemony and secure it for the next century, uh, we got exactly the opposite out of it. You know, instead of a unipolar world, we got a multipolar world. I mean, Iran has been emboldened, right? Turkey has sought its own way. Saudi Arabia has sought its own way. Russia has a foothold. China is sitting pretty, um, et cetera, and we are now not so much reviled but not trusted as a regional partner. And I think that that, that is the, the lasting impact of the Iraq war. Will, it, it will be with us for, for generations um, and has decidedly weakened America's status and, and ability to protect its interests in, in that region. And um, they wanted us in Iraq at the time of ISIS, but they didn't love us. No. 
uh, briefly, Alex, before we get sure, a few more sure, questions. Sure, sure, very more. quick. Uh, I, you know, I just want to point out something we know. It's been over 15 years since the U.S. moved into Iraq. So uh, a good part of the Iraqi society, obviously not a majority of the Shias, but a good part of the Shia communities in, in Iraq have looked to Iran for support, for ideological uh, leadership, and guess what comes with that? Comes good dose of anti-Americanism mm -hmm. because of, so that to me doesn't come as a surprise, although I agree with Paul, it was surprising as, as great as it is. In terms of the um, Saudi Arabia and, and, and the, what David talked about, the Khashoggi affair, I just want to say, should we take it that seriously? Before the unfortunate tragedy with Jamal, you had Saudis and Qataris uh, fighting over, uh, you know, why the U.S. wasn't in love with them more than the other side. This is sort of, I think the emotions were running high. I was an internal family feud, if you will. But I don't know if it's going to be a, a lasting impact in terms of how they view the United States. Because fundamentally, the Gulf states, as far as I can see, and we heard what our panelists here said about China, but I don't see any evidence that anybody among the GCC countries realistically think U.S. can be replaced by another party, be it Russia, be it China, or European Union. Great, let's take two final questions. This gentleman who had his hand up, do you still have a question? Yeah. No, all right. Uh, this lady here in the front, and I'm sure there's a second question. Does anybody else have a question? All your questions have been answered. It's right here. Um, this Please. Uh, this may be a somewhat simplistic question, but on the Iraq polling data, if you've been an occupying army, essentially, for as long as we have, just, would you really think that people would have a positive view? Mm -hmm. I, I just, I'm a little puzzled about the reaction to the, the negativity. Yeah, I, I, and, I, and I too. I mean, I do, we've historically gotten very low numbers in Iraq. I mean, being, being viewed as strong, being viewed as, in some instances, needed or essential, but being viewed as trusted or liked or respected, those are entirely different, different issues. When we asked the question during the, the rise of ISIS, um, do, do, should the West play a role? Should the U.S. play a role? We got a yes. Do they like it? No, they don't. And the feeling of, 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 of like I said, that'll be with us for a, a, for a generation, and, and not just in Iraq, but actually in, in other countries in the region. I was surprised by the really high numbers in Saudi Arabia um, and UAE, but when I thought about the, you know, when Trump was first elected and went over to Saudi Arabia and was greeted as he was, and, and uh, that made some sense, but I do think that there's gonna be a settling in um, and Saudis will go back to where they were, um, a, you know, just a few years ago in terms of their feelings about the United States. We have not behaved as a trusted partner um, and as a country that engenders uh, respect and goodwill. Our strongest assets in that region are the ones that we downplay, and that is our cultural values um, and, um, um, and our accomplishments and, and the fact that we are viewed as a welcoming society. Well, we're losing that a little bit, <laughs> but we still have the cultural values. And I used to say I, the, the, that sometimes I think our, um, our best public diplomats were like Starbucks and McDonald's, you know? Uh, and and, and we, we dismiss it, but in fact, you know, when people go to a Starbucks or a, or a McDonald's, it's not because the food's better or the coffee's better. It's because they're doing an American thing and they like it. They feel good about it. They, it's the closest they can come. When they wear a, a basketball jersey with Stephen Curry's name on it or a New York Yankees hat uh, in, in the, the boys in Saudi Arabia, it's not because they love America, but they love the culture and the value system that we project. And behind all of those things is a value system that we sometimes don't understand. But our use of military force and the arrogance with which we've displayed it and the, the condescending attitude that we have and the fact that, you know, on the, on the Khashoggi thing, that we, it turns on a dime in terms of the way the press begins talking uh, about, about not just the act itself or the, the, the leaders of the country, but speak about Saudi Arabia as a whole 
creates a very different, we know you didn't like us ever, you know, that, that kind of thing. And I think that it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out in the next year or so when we do the, the next poll on this. And I'd be eager to see your, your work, David. Thank you. It, it, our website is uh, on the thing. It's at Zogby underscore research. Um, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to write because I'd love to answer them if you didn't get to, to ask them today. Thank yes, you. well, yet another interesting poll and looking forward to next year's. And please join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you, Mr. Cook.